Welcome all ye winches and scurvy dogs to this week's TDD Weekly Report. Yeah, getting in the mood for Halloween, eh? What do you think? Pirate Greybeard? I think it fits. Six, absurd pirate myths you may not know about. But I'm going to tell you about three of them, and then I'm going to give you the link to the other three. First off, the eye patch. A lot of people think pirates, because of their fighting and sword play, Lost a lot of body parts, including eyes, limbs. Well, that may be true, but the biggest reason they wore the eye patch is when you're fighting, you're fighting above deck and below deck. And with the light changing all the time, what better to do than when you're in a fight to retreat to below decks and your partner that uh, you're fighting against all of a sudden is blind in the dark and you take your eye patch off and your eye is totally adjusted to the dark. Really good way to win a fight really quickly. And the second myth I'm going to tell you about is the Jolly Rogers flag. A lot of times, if you were a naval vessel or a merchant vessel and you saw a pirate flying the black flag, that means you were going to be okay. What you wanted to look for was the red flag. And the reason why the Jolly Rogers got its name is another name in French for the Jolly Rogers flag was that was actually tra mistranslated into the English as Jolly Rogers was Jolie Rouge which meant pretty red, and that meant if you saw the plain red flag flown by the pirate ship, they were ready for war and ready to attack you. Back in those days, it was not unusual for kings and queens to pay off pirates to be their enforcers. They would be privateers. In other words, if you were maybe the king or queen of France, you would pay the pirate ship off to leave your ships alone, but to attack maybe the, if you were at the time not liking the Spanish or the English, you would pay them to attack those and leave your ships alone. So, if your ship saw the black flag, they were doing okay. They were going to be, the pirates were going to give way. But if they saw the red flag, get ready for attack. The third myth I'm going to talk about, and there's six total, and I'll put the link down below so you can read all six myths. The third myth is about the pirates being criminal types fighting against the professional sailors and seamen of the naval forces. Well, that wasn't, that sometimes could be true, but wasn't exactly true all the time because you would have a lot of times, especially in the English Navy, you would have half the crew and sometimes 75% of the crew were people that were forced against their will to become sailors. They would actually take some of the ruffians when they would come into port and they would go out and they would basically grab any able-bodied man that had functioning arms and legs and drag them aboard the ship. And then when they would pull into different ports, those people were not allowed to go ashore like the volunteers where they were basically just chained to the ship and forced to stay there. So the one thing the captain had to worry about when the pirates attacked was not just the pirates themselves attacking, but his own crew mutinying. And you can't blame them, really. They probably had a better lot because as far as a sailor, if they were force conscripted, they either got paid very little or probably not paid at all and punished for any little infraction if they had any chance to join the other side. And you got to realize most of the pirates were people that had already switched sides, so they were probably uh, pretty eager to welcome other people to help them on board uh, so yeah, that could turn around for you very fast. I will put the link down below to the six myths, so there's three more to read about. Most of the myths actually were started with Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, the book, and then perpetuated through Disney and other pirate movies. So take a look at that if you get the chance. And the World Solar Challenge, this was last week, and I actually got the link from my buddy Mick for the World Solar Challenge, but... I didn't really promote it last time because the last two times I promoted on the TDD report, it ended up being, as far as the coverage of it, it was still a cool event, but there wasn't really good coverage of it. It was some stuff to read about, a few little videos, but this year they did a much better job, so I'm going to put the link down below to the worldsolarchallenge.org and also their video site, but you can even go onto YouTube and just type World Solar Challenge 2013 and see a lot of coverage of it. What it is, and I'll give you a basic overall, I won't do a lot of spoilers, but the basic overall is teams from all over the world, mostly universities, but also corporations, take their electric-powered vehicles. There's three different classes. They fly their, their uh, cars over to Australia, they start up in Darwin and race all the way down from north to south, all the way down to Adelaide, passing through Alice Springs and Cooper Pedy. It's about 3,000, just slightly over 3,000 kilometers, and it usually takes two to three days for the top teams to get from uh, north to south to the finish line. And it's 
it's really cool. They've got three classes this year. They've got the Cruiser class, which I really like. That was a different class besides um, the Adventure and the Challenger class. The Cruiser class is multi-passenger, and you can gain extra points by having uh, two, three, or four people in your car instead of just one person. So that was kind of cool. They've got that class. I'll just tell you as a hint, the Netherlands really, really kicked some major butt, really. They were the power players this year, but um, Australia did pretty decent, and the United States did fairly decent, too. Queensland even had an entry this year after, uh, I think they set out the last one or two before that, but um, Queensland and Australia had an entrance, too, and they actually took the speed challenge before the race started. They did some speed trials, and they got to have the fastest electric vehicle. So check out. I'll put those links below. They had uh, daily coverage twice. They actually had the specific coverage of the World Solar Challenge um, from the site itself and they had day and uh, evening they broadcast two different shows about six to eight minutes each and it made it a lot better than it has been in the past so if you get a chance check that out also I want to do a shameless promotion for my buddy and also fellow reporter on the TDD report Clash 230 that's K-L-A-S-H 23 and the small letter O he is doing a wall of decals now a lot of uh, the motor vloggers now are doing a decal type of exchange deal if you want to get a chance, I'll put the link down below. Get in contact with him, PM him through his YouTube channel, and get your decal posted on the wall. Uh, below your decal, he's going to have a link to your YouTube channel. So if you want your decal and your channel promoted, he's going to volunteer to do this as a central area. So um, that's a chance to get your information out there and have one central place where we can see what everybody's different decal is. I've already got mine posted on his site, and I'm going to send him a decal. So I urge you, don't just send him the artwork. Um, also, as a thank you for taking the effort, extra effort to do this for the community, um, he's got a post office box too. If I get his permission, I will uh, post that later on uh, down below in the details for the TDD report and uh, send him an actual decal as a thank you for the extra work that he's doing. But yeah, it's nice having a central place where they're all going to be posted. And lastly, another one of my uh, helpers on the TDD report that sends... Uh, links common and also has uh, appeared on the TDD report. My friend Chuck Wachuka, Wachuka guy, he actually has, and I didn't know this, that he's got one of those DJI Phantom quadcopters. I've done some reports on that in the past on the TDD report. That's the quadcopter that can lift a, an action cam, not a heavy one, but something like a GoPro or one of the lighter action cams like that. Well, he not only combined the DJI Phantom with a, an action camera, he also has a little GPS data logger and what he does is he actually tests out some of the, um, uh, the, the fail, he tests out the fail safe of the DJI Phantom quadcopter as far as um, if it loses communications then it comes right back to where it left off so you won't ever lose it but also gives you a little bit of insight as to this little data logger that he uh, it doesn't give you real time, but what it does is uh, when you get back, you can plug that into your computer and it'll actually log the exact course based on GPS coordinates as to where your craft actually went. So I think that's kind of cool. Link below to that video. Please, if you can, check it out and comment on his video. I think it's really cool when somebody tries out new cool gadgets like that. And so that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week. Arrgh.